Welcome to Season 3 of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Ruth Rathblot is really good at hiding. For 25 years, she was able to keep her colleagues and her bosses from seeing her misshapen hand. The sad thing is, she's not alone. A 2013 workplace study shows that 61% of employees hide some part of their identity. Another report exposes that of the 90% of firms claiming to embrace diversity, only 4% consider disability. A 2019 Forbes article said that disabled workers are actually more dedicated and less likely to turn over than non-disabled workers. Rothblatt knows firsthand the misconceptions that plague those with visible and invisible differences. Today, she helps organizations change their mindset. She guides them to rebuild their organization and staff structures to be all-inclusive welcome Ruth Rathblatt. Thank you, Debbie. I'm now building out and I've built out. I'm a TEDx speaker, inspirational speaker, and an author. And I speak at companies around the globe for exactly what you just said, which is this idea of how can I work with leaders to expand the conversation on diversity so that it's fully inclusive so that their employees can unhide, thrive, and belong? Because those are the cultures that we want to work in. Yeah. And going back, did your parents treat you differently because of the limb difference? Did they try to shelter it from others and help you hide? What's interesting is they didn't. They treated me like I was any other child. Um, I was born in the days before sonograms. So my limb difference, my hand was definitely an anomaly. It was something that a lot of doctors and nurses hadn't seen before. And my parents didn't know they weren't, they were surprised when I was born. My father was rushed out of the hospital room. My mother stayed there and they took me away from her to kind of sat, swaddle me up and clean me up. And the doctor took my father out of the room because he wanted to prepare my mom. And when my father went back in and they talked, there was a nurse luckily in that room, that delivery room who said, you're going to take this little girl home and you're going to love her and you're going to treat her as you would any other child. You're going to treat her as normal. And that's exactly what they did. They treated me and as normal, quote unquote, and they encouraged me to try everything. And while that was really important, Debbie, and I imagine we'll dig into this, there wasn't always the space to talk about the difference in my mm-hmm. world. And so I think that sometimes an opportunity, you know, when we treat young people or even people with differences or and disabilities as quote unquote normal, we sometimes leave, don't leave space for actually talking about how they feel hmm. or how they're thinking about their journey. That That's really interesting. Imagine when you're, it doesn't matter what age you are too, right? Mm-mm. It's something that if you have something that is quote unquote different about you, And you still try to either hide it like I did for 25 years, literally keeping it tucked in my pocket or under long sweaters or behind book bags and things like that. I could do everything. I mean, I ski, I water ski, I, I, I kayak. And yet it's the talking about sometimes about our differences and our disabilities that we don't always give space to because it, it either makes us uncomfortable or it can make other people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and you see that with people in wheelchairs all the time. It doesn't really matter how it happened. It's just different. You know, everybody has something. 
No, I think everybody absolutely has something. And think about the way we talk to children, right? I don't blame us as adults for not being comfortable because what we learn as children is when we ask a question, because I get asked it a lot, but I think it's a natural childhood piece to to them is curiosity, right? Kids Mm -hmm. have no filters. So they ask questions. They'll say, miss, what happened to your hand? And I will say back, I'm like, this is the way I was born. This is something that's different about me. There's something different about all of us. And immediately, Debbie, a parent or a guardian or someone watching that child will rush over and say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That. And so now we do two things. We signal and message that curiosity is not a good thing. So there's only certain times to be curious. So we limit that childhood nature And the second is we signal that disability is something we don't talk about to children. Mm -hmm. And then we grow up to be those adults where we've learned that disability is something you don't talk about because disability is negative. Disability has stigma and stereotypes. And so don't ask, pretend you don't see it. And And getting back to that child that asks, and usually when children ask that all the time and they don't have that shelter of the parent saying, oh, sorry, they'll ask the question and they'll just like, OK, whatever. So let's they play. On. Right. They, move on. <laughs> yeah. it's the they don't care. Children. But when we step in and make it this space that's not OK, then they get a message that starts to be ingrained in terms of how they think about difference. It shows up a lot with disability and it shows up with other differences too. Like you're not supposed to ask. I use a mantra of thinking about asking out of support and asking out of kindness. That's why you're asking, especially as adults, like not to be nosy to your point around people who are in wheelchairs or who have amputations or have differences in sight or hearing. It's why do you need to know? Like, is it out of kindness and is it out of support? because I know I have a disability. Like I, nobody's going to make me aware. I got it. And if you want to ask me, is it because you're asking out of kindness and support because maybe you could help me in some way or because you think it'll make us be able to be connected in a different way. Or they treat you differently because they think you're weak or you're incapable. (laughs) Those are the stigmas that we've set. And the truth is people with disabilities are often thinking two or three steps ahead Mm. and accommodating and adapting in ways that others can't even imagine. Yeah. So you mentioned how you hid, but especially in school, like you were active, but in school, kids get into groups inside and outside the classroom. Did nobody see So I started, I didn't hide it throughout most of my childhood. I started hiding it when I went to a new school. I started a new high school. And I remember getting on that yellow school bus that day, really nervous because I was going to a new school. It happened to be a co-ed high school. And I got on the bus and someone stared just a little bit too long at my hand because, you know, natural thing for teenagers is to check each other out. Will I like them? Will they like me? And I started to look around and I then saw someone notice my hand and they stared again, just a little too long that made me nervous. And so I impulsively tucked my little hand into the front left pocket of my jeans. I had never done that before. And so I sat there and I thought, well, this is just going to be for the bus ride. I just want to fit in for this bus ride. I don't want to go. I, this is, I'd never done it before. And then I got to school and I kept hiding it. And no, they didn't know. I started to learn how to hide it in situations, whether it was book bags or putting it under books, or sometimes even leaving my classroom early so that I could get to my locker to get my books in and, and do the lock and all of that. Because I was thinking, I started to think two or three steps ahead so that no one would see it. And that pattern lasted for 25 years. I hit it in school. I hit it in jobs. I hit it all the time. Talk about that feeling of isolation and how that weighed so heavily. Were Does that make you kind of afraid to make friends? 
it doesn't make you necessarily afraid to make friends, but what it does is hiding is absolutely exhausting and lonely Mm -hmm. for sure. And why it's exhausting and lonely is because the exhaustion comes from having to always think about what situations you're putting yourself in. It's, it's exhausting because you, oh, should I go to that picnic? Well, how am I going to sit? It's going to be hot out. Do I, I have to wear long sleeves because I don't want anyone to see, or do my outfits always have pockets? If I'm going to a social event, how am I going to hold certain things and not have someone see it? So it's a, the, the mental exhaustion from having to figure out all those ways to hide is, is hard. And then the loneliness comes from the fear of someone finds out, finds out something different about me, that's different about me, they won't like me, they'll reject me. So there's also a mental piece to that. And what happens is you stop doing the things that you really enjoy because you get overwhelmed with anxiety of, well, someone's going to find out I can't, I won't be able to do the thing. I definitely won't be able to do it with one hand. So you, it stops you from doing the things you love. I stopped going to the beach with friends, not just because I didn't love wearing a bathing suit. That wasn't it. It was, I didn't want to wear short sleeves. I didn't want to have somebody see it. I stopped going skiing and I used to do a lot of activities because I didn't want anyone to see, I did theater for years. So all those pieces, that's where the exhaustion and the loneliness come from is you, you prevent yourself from doing the things that you enjoy. And that keeps you isolated. That keeps you disconnected. And you almost become Debbie disconnected with yourself, right? Because now it's this person versus that, that person who used to love to do things. She now, or he or she, or they now shelter themselves from it. Um, Your superpower is probably finding female clothes that have pockets. (laughs) Definitely one of them. I mean, who knew that dresses for galas and dances? Now they're kind of coming back, those pockets. They weren't for a while. And I think they help everyone. I've seen women who say, oh, I love to be able to have my lipstick or a business card in a pocket. Because men can go with, you know, in traditional dress. I don't understand why we, we, even our pants don't have pockets <laughs> right because it's a slimming look it's a more slimming look right I know okay. I got really good at that I probably have never thought of it as my superpower but because I think <laughs> I have some others but that's interesting yeah that's the adjustment you're always making when you don't want to take your purse but you want to take your phone you want to take your keys and maybe a Kleenex but you got nowhere to put it <laughs> You have nowhere to put and imagine adding on to that a hand, like wanting to hide a hand. So where yes. does that go in between all of it? So yeah, that was my life work life story for so many years. It was absolutely exhausting and lonely. And I think the other piece is you think you're the only one. You yes. think you're the only one who doesn't have it all together, the only one that's hiding something about themselves. And that's actually not reality. Well, getting to that. When you're in the workplace, do you look around and do you suspect there's some other people that might be hiding something as well? Like maybe not necessarily the same type of difference, but something else? Or do you have like this radar where, okay, I know they're they're compensating and hiding something or does that not I think come to play? when you're hiding, when you're deep into hiding, and again, most of us are hiding something. I think you are not thinking about other people. You're thinking about yourself and how Mm -hmm. it's almost, I don't want to make it dramatic sounding, but it feels like survival. Like, how am I going to take care of myself? So no one judges me. No one rejects me. No one, I don't reject myself. And the truth is I make it comfortable for other people when I'm hiding because they don't have to deal with it then. So I think it's much more internalized. And I will say that, so I would say I didn't, um, look for other people who are hiding. Cause I truly thought I was the only one hiding. I, I, at one point, Debbie thought I invented hiding. Like I thought, Oh, well, I'm the only one that's hiding. <laughs> what I didn't realize is through the research and writing of my book that so many of us are hiding just like the statistic that you mentioned that I referenced, which is that 61% of people are hiding something. And Debbie, I think that number is so much higher. That was a yeah. 2013 study. Think about what the last 10 years have been like 
let alone the last three years where people have hidden behind blank screens, right? Cameras off, muted microphones. People have gotten comfortable in this controlling the certainty of their environment from home that we don't know. I mean, I have through, through my book and my TEDx, people have shared what parts of themselves that they're hiding, whether it's the person who was hiding that they're immobile from the legs down and they were hired during COVID and they don't want their coworkers to know, or the person who has a child with mental health challenges that mutes their microphone and their camera because they don't want to see, they don't want their fellow employees seeing that meltdown or those challenges and thinking that they're a bad parent or guardian. So people, are, yeah, are hiding things all the time. I have talked to people who hide their accents, their stutter. I mean, mm. hide their financial backgrounds, their religion. It's hiding the is- culture too sometimes. Absolutely. It's hiding if is- You universal. can pass as a different culture than you've seen that it happen as well. I think that absolutely happens with many types of religion. It happens with politics. People don't share yes. their politics because they're so afraid of the rejection or the judgment. Um, so well, it's funny. This weekend, uh, I finally saw the whale movie. Hmm. Don't know if you've seen it, but speaking of hiding, he was a teacher and he did Zoom calls. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's with Brendan Fraser. Yes. Right? And, yeah. and he won an Academy for it. He's a teacher and teaches classes online, but his camera is always off mm. because he's so obese. It's really, really good. But And then finally at the end, he finally reveals himself. And There's judgment, right? There's judgment around difference. There's judgment that we all have. It's that whole subject area of unconscious bias. And so how do we move past if we know that's true about ourselves that we all have unconscious bias how do we allow for questions so that yeah. we can move past the bias and start to have conversation and not fear getting in trouble fear being you know called into hr in the workplace like that because i think that goes along 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 with well i'm not going to say anything then i'm not going to i'm going to act like i don't see it so that i don't get in trouble well how do we create, then how do we create conversations so that people can talk about difference and diversity um, in ways that don't exclude people? Tell us about that moment when you finally decided to shed your shield. How did others treat you after that? And what type of work were you doing at the time? Sure. So as I shared, I was hiding for 25 years. And there's a point that you get so exhausted and burnt out and lonely. And I it was affecting my personal life and it was affecting my professional life. And it, it wasn't that I wasn't getting promoted. I was getting promoted into senior roles. I eventually was leading organizations. And so it wasn't holding me back in the sense of, oh, people were thinking I couldn't do the job. It was that I wasn't connecting to my teams in authentic ways. I wasn't connecting, I wasn't sharing my journey. So I was really adapting this old school mentality of leadership where we keep people at arm's length, we don't show vulnerability, we stay disconnected from our teams because if that means if we blur the boundaries a little bit and let them know that we may have challenges, then we're going to what not be seen as capable. And so I was definitely in a space of full exhaustion, I would say definitely burning out. And I knew I couldn't keep going like that. And I imagine, Debbie, there may be some of your listeners who have felt just like that, that space of I'm exhausted, I'm burning out, something's got to change. At one point, I made a choice to, I went had therapy and I made a choice to let someone in. And I invited this person in to show me basically how to unhide. And that person showed me how to actually look at my hand, how to touch it, how to actually take care of it. I hadn't done that before. I'd spent so many of my years doing everything single-handedly that I didn't know how to let someone in to help. And yeah. it was in those moments that I started to then change the way I saw myself. Because as I could let him in, but also I could let myself get to know me, I started to, to change how I saw myself and I started to let other people in too. And I will say that's 
I have this four step method to unhiding, which is it starts with acknowledging what you're hiding, right? So it's that space of, wow, I'm hiding my hand for me. It's exhausting. It's lonely. It's preventing me from connecting with others and connecting with myself. The second step is inviting someone in that you trust. And I imagine if your listeners are thinking about it, somebody often pops to mind of someone that you can trust, right? Someone that you can invite in, whether it's a friend, a coworker, especially in the workplace, a manager, somebody in HR, somebody that you can trust with this piece that's holding you back. And then it's the idea of starting to build your community. And that's why what I see in the workplace and what helped me is the idea of ERG groups or affinity groups, or these groups of where you can connect with people who are having the shared experiences. Cause that's what happened to me. I found a group of people with limb differences who I thought, again, I was the only one that had ever hidden my hand. Not true. There were so many people who had gone through such similar patterns and we all thought we were so alone. And so that building community part is super important. And then I'll say the next, the fourth and final step is sharing out your story. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that looks like going on podcasts, speaking around the world around about this topic so that someone else may say, Hey, I find myself there too. And wow, I see myself in her. What do I need to, how do I stop this part of my life? Because as, as I started to unhide, I started to build deeper connections. I started Mm -hmm. to trust people differently. I started to trust myself and I got back to living the things I loved doing. And that was freeing and lightening for sure and healthy. And I know the subject of, and the title of your podcast is about growth, right? It's a locker room for growth. That's what unhiding is. It's about growth and it's about connection. Hmm. And you've traveled a lot of countries too. And Hmm. So when you were there, did you notice that people who had physical disabilities were, or people who were different were treated differently in a lot of those countries or like, were they accepted? Was it better than here or (laughs) what was it like? Yeah, I think there is still stigma. We have a history with disability in our country, in North America, around the world, around what disability means, right? In terms of, and you referenced one of the words before, which is weak. So oftentimes there's a stigma and stereotype about weakness. There's Mm -hmm. also a stigma and stereotype about other and othering to people with disabilities. I'm not going to make a global blanket statement probably, but I think that there's still a lot of work to do in for all of us around disability acceptance. Even just sometimes saying the word disability. It's interesting though. I think some people don't want to say the word word disability because maybe it's insulting to you. It's not. It's actually, to me, strength and community. I will say one of the places that I was so in love and surprised with is Paris. And I have been to Paris many times. It wasn't until I remember going up to a window and it was at the Eiffel Tower I went up to get our tickets and after standing and waiting in line for hours to get these tickets Mm -hmm. and I was giving the concierge my money and he noticed my hand and he said, he gave me my money back. And I said, okay, so I guess I can't go. And he's like, no, you go for free. You have a disability. And I'm like, I do. And he's like, and your companion does too. And I'm like, what? What? And I started to notice all through Paris that disability is something that's taken seriously in terms of accommodations and accessibility. So there isn't that waiting in line for people with disabilities. There isn't that there's a a specialist that's of, we understand that this may be something different and that you may need accommodations for it. And so I think if we start to look at countries and thinking about accessibility and accommodations, that's going to be really important and because it'll translate that how we treat people with disabilities. So we talked a little bit before we hit the record button about visibility in different individuals and how architectural designs, accessibility services, ledger activities, ageism, and so much more 
like you say, we've got a long way to go to uh, to be inclusive. But in your current line of work, how to help address these issues, how do we get them to hear this message to include this aspect into DEI? Yeah, that's a really juicy question. Because I think often when we talk, I guess the first part is, Often when we talk about diversity, we talk and we think about race and ethnicity, we think about gender, and we think about sexual orientation, right? Those are kind of the three big work streams or buckets that we think about with diversity. And often disability is left out of the conversation. What's interesting is when we start to look at the numbers of disability, it actually is the largest minority group. So it needs to be included as part of the diversity conversation. It also connects and intersects with every lens of diversity, whether it be, you can be any race, any gender, any sexual orientation, to your point, any age. The disability can affect you. You can be born with a disability. You can acquire one at some point in your life, or you can be taking care of somebody with a disability. So disability doesn't discriminate. It affects us all. And so as we build out diversity programs, when we leave disability out of the conversation, we're not having a full diversity conversation. And so some of the ways that we can amplify disability in diversity conversations are around, A, making sure that our internal HR and leadership thinks about goals and around disability, like that's part of how we're thinking about the entire talent life cycle. How do we recruit people with disabilities? How do we engage them? And how do we take seriously their exit interviews as we go forward? How do we actually measure it? Because if we don't measure it, we're not really counting it. So we don't know what our employee population looks like. So there's an accountability piece to it. And then how are we staffing in terms and training our teams internally around disability and disability awareness and accessibility. It's interesting, and you may have run into this in your world, we often think about accommodations as only for people with disabilities. And so then people get nervous, well, I can't say anything because I don't want to be seen as high maintenance. I don't want to be seen as costing the company something because they'll say no to it. They won't be believed. I'll have to get in every doctor's note. Why instead wouldn't we think about accommodations for everyone so that you say, what supports do you need to do your job best? And that's part of the answer. And then it's about, I have this model, another framework that I've built out, which is called the cure to inclusion. And it focuses on four letters and it's an acronym for connection, understanding, representation, and empathy as a way to build a full diversity program through the talent life cycle. And the biggest part of the starting place is understanding your own views around difference and disability. And it's about leadership taking the first step because if leaders aren't gonna take the first step in thinking about their ideas and their biases around disability and difference, then we're not ever gonna solve for this because leaders need to go first. And I fought that for a really long time I had people come in and say, when I was a leader, oh, what's the culture like here? And I'd say, oh, well, everyone helps dictate the culture. I don't work with robots. Everyone's part of it. What I didn't realize is that as a leader, I went first. I had to go first in terms of setting culture and setting um, tone. And that I part of it was allowing for people to get to know me in different ways and know my journey of my limb difference and my disability. And that that would then open up because what I realized is I was creating cultures where people were afraid to share their vulnerabilities and share their challenges. I was creating this quote unquote, perfect hidden workplace. And that's not a healthy workplace. It doesn't allow for retention, for creativity, for engagement or innovation. And so leaders need to go first. And that's part of the work that I do now is helping leaders to expand the conversation on diversity and difference so that their employees can unhide and thrive and belong. I guess the other piece I would just add to you is it's also about doing an internal audit about of representation, whose voices are heard, whose voices are not heard, so that you can get a sense of 
where you may not be listening. Looking back on your life now, how have you changed as a person since you went down this path? It has brought me freedom. It has allowed me to sleep at night. It has allowed me to engage in other activities and things that I got back to living my life. I got back to doing the things. And to your point from before, like I travel now, I travel in such different ways. I was in Belize a few years ago and doing a sabbatical and went zip lining. And even though there was some disruption with the zip lining because they thought I couldn't do it or one of the guides thought I couldn't do it with one hand, I stood up for myself and I said, no, no, tell me the rules of engagement here, like how I do everything. And luckily there was another guide who overheard and said, oh yeah, you only need one hand to zip line, you'll be fine. So it got me back to advocating for myself and doing the things I love. Though I will tell you, I just posted about that this morning. I went to a recent talk show to be a audience member. And one of the activities was to break a board in half with our hand. And I got really nervous and that anxiety started to creep up again of not that I was going to have to show my hand, but more, could I do it? Now I've done things my entire life. I've held things. I've done everything, I think at this point. But what was so amazing to me is that those voices of self-doubt were still so surface level, even though I'd worked through a lot, they were still there. And so it's a constant reminder of we need to continue growing. We need to continue challenging ourselves, And that's what I've been doing. And it was a great exercise to work through, not to dismiss it and say, well, I don't have that anymore. No, I, I did. It was real. I saw, I felt the anxiety. I felt the nerves coming up of, could I do it? What if I hurt this hand? It's my only hand that writes and things like that. And I do a lot of writing and not to dismiss it, but to acknowledge those fears because that only then can you really move past them and change. If you ignore them, they'll follow you. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, people always other people, doesn't matter what they are, you know, they gossip no matter, they don't even have to have a difference. Your inner talk is different now, right? So like you just mentioned, you have to work through that inner talk so that you don't believe what they're saying. (laughs) It's like a reality check a lot of the time because, but I think again, even with all the work I've done, I mean, I've been to therapy, I have unhidden, I've written a book about this, right? Like, and I, and I speak around it. It's still very easy to let that voice slip in a little bit because it's still Mm -hmm. there. And so how do you deal with that voice rather than saying it doesn't exist or running away from it? Confront it, acknowledge it. You know, I hear you. What am I really worried about here? And then letting it go because the reality is I could break that board and I could hold the board for someone else to break. Yeah. And it was beautiful. It was a victory, but it was about letting go of that internal voice. You're on a much needed path. Are there others who carry the torch with you? Where does this go from here? The the beauty of this is I think there are a lot of people who are on this path of growth and thinking about diversity in different ways. First, expanding that conversation around diversity. I think the disability community is definitely, and there's so many amazing people in that community that want to expand the diversity conversation. So that's first. And I think the unhiding piece is, you know, when I first came up with that name of unhiding, I got some pushback saying, well, what does that even mean? When Sheryl Sandberg talked about leaning in, did we all know what she meant by that? No. So explaining unhiding and hiding has been an opportunity to connect with people and for people to say, oh, me too. Wait, I've been doing that. And Debbie, people, when they own what they're hiding, or at least are allowed to say it out loud, it's like their shoulders drop and they exhale. Mm. And so the mantle of unhiding is absolutely, the torch is absolutely being being moved um, in terms of building out this community of people for unhiding and giving space to it so that you're not so alone. That's the perfect way to end this. Thank you so much, Ruth. It was just wonderful to have you on the show. 
No, thank you for giving me the opportunity to amplify the message of unhiding. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.